Event in V prime, only that much I can guess. But this is equal to this. So, if I go to left hand side, this much is in V, and when I put T on this, it is in RT. So, I have some element in V prime which is equal to an element in RT, that means this is also in RT, correct. So, I am taking an element in RT and showing its action on that element is producing another element in RT for all G and for all such elements which means R of T is an invariant subspace. Completeness is the property of the space itself, invariance is the property of the space under some action of an additional group uh, representation. Okay. So, is this clear? Madam? Not clear? Did you understand how n of t is invariant? Yes? How is this invariant? I have taken an element from n of t and then what I have to show? When d of g acts on this element, I will get an element that belongs to n of t. That is what I have to show. So, I am using this intertwining operation. So, if I take this t of x, see without x, this is the intertwining operation. Now, I am putting x from the right hand side on both equations. t of x is 0. Why? Because x is in n of t. So, right hand side is 0. So, t acting on d g of x equal to 0 implies d g of x is also in n of t. This is true for all g because I did not choose any particular g. g is arbitrary here. That means, this n of t will remain invariant under the action of representation d of g. So, it is an invariant subspace of v. It is an invariant subspace of v. Is this clear? So, how do we show something is an invariant subspace? When group representation acts on the element of vector space or the subspace, it should not go out of that subspace. Correct? So, same thing is here. Now, range of t is a subspace of V prime. So, I take an element in R of t. Every element in R of t will be like t into some element in V. Correct? Every element in R of t will be like this T x for some x in V. So, I am taking one such element and applying D prime on that and I have to show that it will belong to R of t. Then only I can say R of t is a invariant subspace. So, here the showing that is not so direct like that because when I put D prime of j and T of x, I will get from this side I will get as if I am getting some element in V prime only. But that element is equal to this. dg of x is an element in V, t into any element will be in a RT. So, this whatever is y prime here will be some element in RT. So, this is also in RT. We cannot have left hand side in RT and right hand side not in RT, right. So, for every t x, d prime g gives another element in RT, which means RT is an invariant subspace. Okay? Now, once you know R t is an invariant subspace, we started with an assumption that d and d prime are irreducible representations. If d prime is an irreducible representation, then v prime should not have a non-trivial invariant subspaces. Correct? That is our earlier chart. Non-trivial invariant subspace means reducible. No non-trivial invariant subspaces means irreducible. Since this is irreducible, you should not have any non-trivial invariant subspace. So, since R t is an invariant subspace, it has to be one of those trivial invariant subspaces. What are the two trivial invariant subspaces? 0 and the full space. Now, if R t is equal to 0, what does it mean? All elements in V are mapped onto 0. When will that happen? When t itself is 0. You cannot, if t is non-zero, at least there will be some element in t which will not be mapped onto 0, correct? So, if r of t equal to 0, then t is equal to 0. But if you hand non-zero t, then r of t has to be the full space. If r of t is full space, then t is on 2. So, this proof tells us t is on 2 and this part of the proof tells us t is 1 1, 
combining these two t is non singular if n of t equal to 0 t is 1 1 t of okay let me uh, i will answer that question any other questions that is if null space is 0 how t is 1 1 that is the question that he is asking null space is not uh, null uh, null set means what 0 only 0 no null space means all elements of v which will be mapped on to 0 in v prime so that will not be null set what is the definition of a 1 1 map to 1 so how do we write mathematically if t x equal to t y then x has to be equal to y correct if x y are different t x and t y are different that is meaning of 1 1 correct so suppose if uh, <coughs> if this is not 1 1 that means t of x is equal to t of y for uh, x and y are different ok so I am going to show a contradiction so if x is not equal to y t of x is equal to t x is equal to t y this means it is not 1 1 x and y are mapped to same element in that that means it is not 1 1 then I can write x minus y take it on the other side I write x minus y this is an element in the vector space x plus minus y is an element in the vector space what will this be equal to 0 this will be 0 right that means what x is not equal to y so x minus y is not 0 that means what x minus y in n of t but we have already assumed that n of t is 0 if 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 you have any function which is not 1 1 then there will be a vector in x in v which will also be in n of t non zero vector. this is a contradiction ok so the only way that n of t is 0 is by having t to be 1 1 function in group theory of mathematical physics 5 marks question are ok so let me write a corollary or maybe I simply call it a result suppose v is equal to v prime and d is equal to d prime we have same vector space and same representation then what we have t on d g is equal to d g this is the intertwining operation if any such t exists what will be the t that is the question that we are going to ask if any such t exists what will be the t for what t does this is true for what t does this is uh, does this ok now I will I will use this Schur's lemma to show this answer I can write this as <coughs> this also implies we can write for some lambda t minus 
lambda into identity on d of g is equal to d of g into t of t minus lambda times i. So, if t is intertwining then t minus lambda i also will intertwine for any arbitrary lambda. This is true for every lambda. Since this is true for every lambda, choose a lambda such that determinant of t minus lambda i, determinant of t minus lambda i is equal to 0. That means I am choosing a lambda as one of the eigenvalues of t are roots of the characteristic equation of this t minus lambda i determinant is equal to 0. Now, what happens if I choose that? This becomes 0, correct? This becomes 0. Why? If the determinant is not equal to 0, if determinant is equal to 0, it is singular, correct? But remember, Schur's lemma tells you, if it is singular, the only uh, way of being singular is by being 0 only. There cannot be non-zero and singular, correct? So that means, t minus lambda i is singular. since determinant is 0 for the chosen lambda. Schur's lemma, what does it tell you? Implies t minus lambda i is singular only by being t minus lambda i to be equal to 0. You cannot have a non-zero and singular, which implies t is the multiple of an identity. This is a very interesting result. If you have, if you have a transformation which commutes with all other group representation, gr uh, these are matrices. If you have a matrix which will commute with all the representation matrices, it has to be a multiple of identity. If this representation is an irreducible representation. In other words, if only identity can commute with all the representation matrices, then the representation is an irreducible representation. Okay? So, if D is irrep, irreducible representation, if and only if a multiple of identity commutes with d of g for all g not necessarily there can be a constant along the diagonals, lambda, 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 like that. Identity means 1, 1, 1, 1, but you can have a multiple of identity. So, I have now set the stage for proving what is called great orthogonality theorem. And once we prove that orthogonality theorem, then we are ready to apply group theory.
to molecules, crystals, and so on. So the result of orthogonality theorem, if you if you want to.